with a DNA20, we got our first official machine learning node from SideFX. While we previously had example scene files that did machine learning related stuff or plugins like MLOps, this is the first machine learning tool that you get just by installing Houdini. So this makes it quite interesting and we should take a look at what it does and what we can use it for. So this is the node that we got. This is the Onyx inference sort. And I should first of all maybe start by explaining these two words right here. Let's first of all start with inference. If you know your neural network lifecycle, you know that we started by building our neural net, then we're training and testing a neural net with our training data, then we validate the use of a neural net, and if we finally are happy with the results that we're getting, then we can finally use a neural net for the actual tasks that we set out to do with this neural net. And this final part, this usage part, this is what we call inference. So our next inference sub in the end will also be just there to use trained neural nets. It's not there to train some neural nets or to build some neural nets. Let's talk about the Onyx part. Why is Onyx important? Well, this starts because doing inference the traditional way is quite cumbersome. We need quite a lot of stuff for this. We need a coding environment, usually Python. We need some machine learning libraries, maybe PyTorch. We need our code, usually stored in a .py file. And we also need the data that we got through training on neural net. This is usually a checkpoint file. And for PyTorch, this is a .pt file. So previously, if we wanted to do something machine learning related in Houdini, we had to make sure that we brought all of those things to Houdini as well, which meant set up a custom Python environment with those libraries, and it's all, again, quite cumbersome. So to make this easier, what also was developed alongside those machine learning tools are so-called machine learning runtimes, and Onyx is one of them. And what those runtimes allow you to do is a runtime, first of all, takes what's usually done with a coding environment and a machine learning library and simply turns it into a program. In this case, this Onyx runtime. And then we, as a user, we can simply take a neural network project, a PI file, and the training checkpoints and export them as an Onyx file, as a single file that we can simply hand over to our Onyx runtime and our Onyx runtime will make sure that we can use this machine learning file in a lot simpler way. And what this in the end means for Houdini is that SideFX took this Onyx runtime and implemented this into Houdini in this Onyx inference sub. And this Onyx file is something that we can provide. We can provide it either because we trained our own neural net and exported it as an Onyx file, or this may be something we got from our technical director at the studio, or maybe this is also something that we simply found on the web because Onyx is an open standard and it's been around for quite a while, so we also find a lot of really good Onyx files online. And that last part is exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to download a bunch of Onyx files and test them inside Houdini. So first of all, to download some files, I went to github.com slash onyx slash models. This is a collection of pre-trained onyx models that we can simply download and play with. And the first one that I'm going to download right here hides under domain-based image classification and is an onyx version of the amnist model, which is a sort of hello world for machine learning. So let's download this. And we can download all these models by clicking on this link right here. And here we have usually a lot of options for selecting different versions, basically an onyx version and an offset version. In the end, there are some technical details surrounding those, but in the end, this mostly boils down to trying different models out and see which work in Houdini and which don't. And in this case, I'm going to use this amnist-12 model, and I'm going to use the simple download without the sample test data. So let's click on this button right here, on this link. And finally, on this page, we can click this download button right here. Handwritten digits are a bit boring. Let's select something that's maybe a bit more interesting. And in here, under image manipulation, we have a fast neural style transfer. So let's try this out as well. Again, we have some options to choose from here. We have, first of all, a bunch of different styles that we can try. And we also have the selection between an offset version of 9 and 8. I think in this case this doesn't matter for Houdini, but at the end I'm going to download this mosaic model and with an offset version of 9. So let's click this download button right here and let's download it here. And finally I wanted to download something that's maybe a bit more useful for us. I wanted to find an Onyx version of the Midas depth estimation model where we can put in an image 
and get a depth map out. And in this case, I found this project from Julian K, which used an Onyx export of Midas for Unity. However, since this is an open standard, we can simply use the same files in Houdini as well. And we can find those files under files and versions in the Onyx folder. And in here, I want to download the DPD Swin2 base model with a resolution of 384 pixels. And I can hit this download button right here to download my model. Now, finally, in Houdini, I want to drop down a GeoNode. I want to dive inside and I want to drop down my Onyx Inference node. And the first thing that I'm going to do always when I bring in such an Onyx node is I first of all want to load in the Onyx file that I downloaded. So in this case, let's start with Amnest. Let's select this Amnest 12 model right here. And next, we want to hit this button right here, this Setup Shapes from Model button. Let's click this and what this button does is it fills in those four parameters with the right values that this net, this model that we loaded in expects. And what those values are, are basically how the data that we're going to feed into a net should be shaped. So let's take a closer look at this. This consists of a bunch of values. Those values are read from left to right and top to bottom. And these are the dimensions of the input tensor. This is a fancy way of saying that we're going to feed our data to a net in a multidimensional array. And that array should have a specific structure that our net expects. Now, the first value inside that array will always be the batch size. So in this case, how many pictures of handwritten digits we're feeding to our net at a time. And usually with those Onyx models, this will be either one. So we going to feed one image at a time through our net, or this is going to be minus one, which means that we can feed any number of images through our net at a time. In this case, this is set to one. Next, because we're feeding in an image, there's a sort of standard data structure and that's quite common with machine learning, which means we get first the number of colors in our images. And in this case, since this is a grayscale image, this is just a value of one. And then we have the resolution of our image, and this is 28 by 28 pixels. This is what we're putting in. And what we're getting out is again our batch size, and then just 10 float values, which will be the 10 probabilities how likely a certain number is based on the image that we're feeding in. So let's finally try this out. Let's first of all create a canvas to write on. In this case, this will be a grid. I'm going to set the size to one by one, but this doesn't matter in this case. What does matter though is the resolution. We have to put in a 28 by 28 pixels like this. Then we need to paint a number onto this. So let's drop down a paint node and I'm going to choose the paint a mask variation of this node. Wire this in, let's switch to a handles tool. Let's make a brush a bit smaller and let's maybe first of all get a visualizer going so we can see what we're doing and let's maybe draw a nice four in here, like this. Jump back to our camera tool and let's feed this to our Onyx net. Now we have to set up the way how we're going to feed this data to our network. In this case, I'm going to use a point attribute. And this point attribute is called, in this case, mask, since I used this paint mask node earlier. And finally, we have to select how we're going to write this data back out again. In this case, again, I'm not going to choose a volume. I'm going to choose a point attribute. And let's maybe call this probab for probability. And now taking a look at the info panel, we have 10 points for 10 values. And if we take a look at those values, we can see them right here. And if we sort by the highest value, we can see by a large margin, four seems to be the most probable digit that we drew right here. And this is of course also correct. We drew a four in here as well. So our net right here is obviously working. However, this isn't hugely exciting. Let's maybe try our style transfer next. Let's drop down another Onyx node. Let's load in our Mosaic 9 model. Again, let's hit Setup Shapes from Model. Now this looks like this. Again, we have first of all a batch size right here. Now we have three values. So an RG and B value, since we're putting in color values. And we have a different image resolution. So in this case, 224 by 224 pixels. And also output matches exactly our input because again, we're just going to transfer a style to our image. So the image size should match our input image as well. Let's set up this. Let's drop down a grid node again. Again, set the size to one by one. But in here, I want to put in 224 by 224 pixels. I also want to set up UVs on this grid. Let's drop in a UV texture node. And for the image that I'm going to load in, I want to change up the scale and offset a tiny bit. 
I'm going to set the y scale to minus one and an offset of one to flip it the right way around. And I want to set the x scale to a value of 0.6 and give it an offset of 0.2. And this is simply there because I'm going to load in a 16 by nine image and putting this onto a square patch of geometry would squash it. And this is there to limit that squash. Now let's finally load in our image. Drop down that rip from map. And in this case, I'm going to load in a teaser image from a previous episode and you can choose your own input image that you like. In this case, mine will be this right here. And let's maybe also turn off a UV grid like this. Let's write this into our Onyx node. Again, we're going to set up how we want to write in and out our data. So in this case, this will be both our point attributes and let's put in our CD both in the input and the output. And since this Onyx node always collapses this output around world origin, we have to copy over attribute again. So let's drop down attribute copy node and let's copy over the CD attribute that the Onyx node spits out in the end. And also maybe rewrite this like this so you can actually see the output. And as we can see right here, there seems to be something wrong with the output. We seem to have made some mistake right here. So what mistake did we make right here? This is something that's quite common with feeding an image data into this Onyx node because the data that we feed in right here, the OCD attribute, doesn't quite match up the data structure right here that our net expects. What do I mean by that? Well, what our net expects is first of all, all the red values, then all the green values within our image, and then all the blue values within our image. This is what this tells us. However, what we're getting it by writing in just a CD attribute is all the RGB values for the first point, then all the RGB values for the second point, and so on and so forth. So again, what our net expects is matching the data that we're feeding in. So in the end, we're getting a garbage output. Luckily, this is quite easy to fix. We just have to restructure our data. First of all, I want to set a different attribute that I want to write in. Instead of writing in a vector attribute, I just want to write in a float attribute that I will call in. And I'm going to write out a float attribute that I will call out. And what I want to create now is a set of points, a set of points with a total number of three by 224 by 224 that matches this data structure. And I can create this with three point wrangles. Let's write in our first one. Again, I'm going to create a new attribute called in, and this should be a float. And this should be equal to, from a CD attribute, just the red value, like this. This is all this wrangle does. Now I'm going to copy this two more times. And on the second one, I'm just going to choose all the green values. And on the third one, I'm just going to choose all the blue values. And now, with our data separated like this, I can merge this back together. And now taking a look at the info panel, I should have three by 224 by 224 points right here. This should add up or multiply up to this value right here. And on those bunch of points, I have the value that I want to feed into a net as a single float value called n. And this now should match this structure up here. So let's feed this into a net. Our net isn't complaining anymore. And now we have to do the same that we did right here to write our data back out to our grid. So attribute copy won't do here. We need another point wrangle. And on this point wrangle, I first of all want to grab all the float values. This will be a point function on GeoStream1, which takes a look at a value called out. And our float values should simply match our PT num that we're putting in. Then let's grab our green value. A green value should match the PT num that we're putting in plus the total number of points that we have on this GeoStream because we have three times less points on this GeoStream than we have on this GeoStream. So to get a number of points, let's first of all create an int called np. And this should be equal to the end points function on geostream0, which gives us the number of points on that geostream. And let's simply write at pt num plus np. And let's do this one last time for our blue values. And our blue values will be the values of our pt num plus np plus np a second time like this. And finally, let's write this out to our CD. This is equal to a vector consisting of our R, G, and B values like this. Now this looks a bit more correct. The one thing that we need to do in the end to make this work is to normalize all those values that our Onyx net here is putting out because the output values of neural nets usually aren't between zero and one values like we need for a color. We have to normalize those ourselves 
So in this case, I'm going to use a labs attribute normalize float. Let's wire this in and wire in our select out attribute in here. And now finally, we have the style transfer on the image that we're putting in. And since I put in an animation, I can scrap in my timeline. And as we can see, the style transfer is working really quite fast and nicely. So this is our style transfer working. Let's maybe now quickly take a look at our depth estimation as well. This in the end should be pretty similar to this setup. So let's just copy this. Let's set our display flag at our next node. Let's load in our dpt swim model. Again, set up shapes from model. Wait for this to cook. Now the data that we're feeding in looks quite similar. We still have a batch size of one, still three colors, but now a different resolution. 384 by 384 and the output looks a bit different as well because we don't have any colors for our output we just have single float values for our depth so in this case our out is just again our batch size and then just our resolution like this so let's set this up here on a grid let's enter 384 by 384 Everything else that we did here, loading in our image and separating it and restructuring our data this should all still work we can still leave this attribute normalized float in here. The only thing that I want to change in here is how we write back our data. We can already see a sort of depth map appearing here. This in this case doesn't need to be this complicated. What we want to do in the end is simply, first of all, grab our depth value. So float depth will be a point attribute on geostream one called out. And since we have the same number of points on this geostream as we have on this geostream, we can simply put in at ptnum in here. And then let's move our points by our depth value. So v at p plus equals a vector that we're going to create. And this has an x value of zero, a y value of depth, and a z value of zero again. Let's take a look at this. This seems to be working already. Let's maybe bring over our attribute from map so we can also see our image overlaid onto this. And yes, this seems to be a sort of working depth map, at least the kind of quality from a depth map that I'm going to expect from a machine learning model. Let's maybe just make this a bit more shallow. Let's maybe take this to a value of 0.3 like this. And yeah, I think this looks a bit more accurate. Now, this is where I'm going to leave this for today. If you're curious about the teaser image of this episode, you can take a look at the scene file. You can see a commented version of how I built this in the end, a style transfer on a geometry inside Houdini. What I want to talk about quickly now is what this means for machine learning in Houdini in the future. Is this now our standard way of doing machine learning stuff inside Houdini? Does this make something like MLOps obsolete? Can we now run, for example, stable diffusion just with those Onyx nodes? And this is where it gets a bit complicated. Stable diffusion in this case is quite a good example because it's a quite complicated neural network pipeline. I made a very simple diagram of this here. Our prompt goes into the text tokenizer. This goes into the clip encoder. Then we have a latent noise, which gets denoised to output image in the end through this unit and scheduler loop. And finally, it gets resized to the final output resolution by a very initial autoencoder. And this, in the end, gives us an output picture. If you played a bit with MLOps, you're somewhat familiar with this structure right here. If you haven't, this isn't really important. What is important is that we can take a look at all these stations that our prompt goes through and sort of categorize them into two categories. We have those orange stations, which all are consisting of neural nets. And we have those blue stations, which are all just standard algorithms. And at least as far as I'm concerned, as far as I got with my testing, I think we can just use the Onyx node for those neural net parts. So we can rebuild or use the clip encoder inside Houdini and the unit and the variational autoencoder, but not the scheduler or the noise generation or the text tokenizer. For those parts of this stable diffusion pipeline, we still would need to either code this ourselves or use some sort of custom Python environment with custom Python libraries. And this, in the end, sort of defeats the purpose of using Onyx in the first place. So with some newer neural network workflows or some more complicated neural network workflows, at least as far as I can see, we are running into some limitations of the tools that we have right now in Houdini. 
I'd love to be proven wrong on this. I'd love to see some more talented TDs tackle this challenge right here and maybe create a working version of Stable Diffusion inside a vanilla Houdini just with those Onyx nodes. I'm really looking forward to this one. But at least from my experience, this at the very least seems to be a pretty difficult task. This isn't something that you build in an afternoon. However, still, with the options that we got right now, we still have quite a lot of neural nets that we can use. And we have also quite a lot of really interesting applications where we can train our own neural nets. This is definitely something that we're going to explore in the future. But until now, I hope you have fun playing with this new Onyx node, trying out different models that you can find online. And until next time, it's cheers and goodbye. If you like what we're doing, please consider becoming a patron of ours. Not only for supporting Antagma, but also for access to in-depth courses, like our advanced setups course, which already includes a couple of videos about neural nets, or a completely revamped beginner series with 30 videos telling you everything about attributes, simulations, and so on. Also, let me say thank you so much to all our existing patrons. Without you, this channel would not be possible. Thank you.